BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Hello. The great Austrian philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein declared, what we cannot speak of, we must pass over in silence, which is pretty hard going for a radio presenter. But trust me, you'll want to listen to my guest talk about one of the landmark philosophical works of the 20th century. Wittgenstein's Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. Join me, Shahid Abari, just after this. Hello, I'm Catherine Tickell, and I'm here to tell you about Music Planet, Radio 3's weekly show covering roots music from around the world. Now, I know that's a pretty big category, but it gives us the opportunity to bring you an eclectic and varied range of music, uh, live sessions from some of the biggest international names, along with the latest emerging talent. We've got classic artists and new releases, and of course, our road trip feature, sampling the music and culture of different locations from around the world, from the deepest of traditional styles to the latest contemporary sounds with local experts on the ground as your guide. Whether it's Malian blues, Indian classical or Colombian champeta, you'll hear it on Music Planet. Find us on BBC Sounds or on Radio 3 Saturdays at 4. Hello. 1921 was a busy year. Adolf Hitler became the Führer of the Nazi Party in Germany. Albert Einstein won the Nobel Prize for Physics. Picasso was painting, Chaplin was acting, and Schoenberg was composing. In other words, the 20th century was well and truly underway. Meanwhile, a young Austrian philosopher by the name of Ludwig Wittgenstein had just published a book. It was called The Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus. Coming in at under 100 pages and consisting of seven basic propositions, the Tractatus investigates the connection between language, thought and the world. And in it, Wittgenstein claimed to have solved all the problems of philosophy. This year marks the 100th anniversary of the publication of the Tractatus, Wittgenstein's only book-length work to be published in his lifetime and widely regarded as one of the landmark philosophical works of the 20th century. So why was it important? What was it about? And who can tell us about it? Well, let me answer the last question at least. Ray Monk, philosopher and Wittgenstein's biographer, Juliet Floyd, philosopher of mathematics and logic, Dawn Wilson, a philosopher who works on the aesthetics of photography, and Monica Nagler Wittgenstein, a broadcaster and critic for Swedish National Radio and the only descendant of the Wittgenstein family still living in Austria. Hello, Ray, Juliet, Dawn and Monica. Hello, Hello. 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 It's lovely to have you. Thank you for joining us. Welcome. We should say that we're talking online as part of a live event organised by the Austrian Cultural Forum in London and the British Wittgenstein Society, who are hosting an array of events to celebrate the centenary of the Tractatus. But before we get stuck into the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, otherwise known as the Tractatus, I wonder if it's possible to get a quick sense of the book from each of you. When did you first encounter it and what were your first impressions. Juliet? Well, I started with later Wittgenstein as an undergraduate, and I thought there was nothing in it at all. And then I got to graduate school, and everyone was reading Wittgenstein. And I finally read later Wittgenstein on math, and I thought, this is a genius. So I then felt I had to go back to the Tractatus, and I found it a kind of dizzying spectacle, I have to say. But somehow I felt the seeds of what came later were there. It's just that it took a very different form. And when I started reading the book, it was widely regarded as a tract of the Vienna Circle, a work of logical positivism. And so I think when I first approached the book, I looked at it that way. And that's not the way I look at the book only anymore. We'll find out more about that, I think. Dawn, what about you? I was a 20-year-old undergraduate when my tutor uh, lured us into the book by promising us that it was a philosophy text with pictures, which I think was a bit of a joke because although it does contain some diagrams, it's also famous for containing an account of uh, the picture theory of language. Um, But it was very intimidating at that time, fascinating, but very intimidating. And I I grasped only tiny elements of it, I think, as part of an undergraduate course. As a graduate student, I I was advised by a fellow graduate student that what I really needed to do was to sit down and in a single sitting, without even being permitted to get up for a cup of tea, read the book from beginning to end, because it's short enough to be able to do that within a few hours. And the idea is don't try and understand every aspect of it. All the technical parts of it will be terribly 
uh, you know, fly over your head, but just get that grasp of how the, the book as a whole, the structure of it works, get the words starting to link together until you can you can feel the exhilaration of the project as a whole and that sold it to me and that's it I've, I've sort of I did my PhD on it I've, I've read it ever since. Oh that's a that's good advice for our, our listeners who, who may be new to the book too. Ray what about you? I first tried to read it when I was 17 before I went to university I became obsessed with philosophy and I read Norman Malcolm's memoir of Wittgenstein and found him an extraordinarily interesting character. My brother then bought me Philosophical Investigations for Christmas, and then I bought the Tractatus. I found it completely incomprehensible, and I uh, bought Anthony Kenny's Introduction to Wittgenstein, and that was my way into uh, the Tractatus. Then when I got to university, I did a course on Wittgenstein, and that was the first time that I was able to read it with some understanding, which is about where I've been for the last 50 years. This is a complex book to understand. I think we, we all agree. And it's a it's a book that pioneers some basic philosophical techniques that are still taught in introductory logic courses to this day. It's a meditation on selfhood, ethics, and the meaning of life. And it's also produced in this early 20th century Vienna context alongside the paintings of Klimt and the psychoanalysis of Freud. So I want you to help me place this book. How can we make sense of it? And, and Monica, I wonder if we can start with the family. Wittgenstein was born in, in Vienna in 1889 to an educated and, and, and wealthy family who were immersed in the cultural life of the city. What kind of role did the Wittgenstein family play in this, this wider cultural scene? Well, they were very wealthy. They were Masonites. But they were mostly interested in music and also art. They never had the literary salon, which is interesting. So I don't think the children were so confronted with literature as they were with music and also with art, Klimt mainly. And if you want to discuss it, I think they had difficulties with that, actually. Uh, I want to say something, a uh, quote of Finnish writer Arno Pasilina. He wrote, nobody is born alone. A person doesn't exist without his background or without his shape. I think that is very suitable for Wittgenstein. He was very close to his family and also was very influenced by Vienna at the time. And as you know, what Vienna was at the time, at the turn of that century. And uh, I think we should not forget that, he, that, that his grounding was there. The, the, the family life in which he's brought up, this, this cultural scene seems really important. He, he's also the youngest son of the family. So, so how does he fit into the, the family dynamics? He had all the privileges because all the older brothers, you know, they committed suicide and the fathers wanted them to be in the business. So he was left alone and he was even able to study mathematics physics and whatever, and go to Berlin and so on. He had a quite a free life. But I would say something which never is mentioned. His sister, seven years older, Grete Wittgenstein, meant a lot for his education. They were very close also, but as a young kid, he was introduced to all these writers in the circles she was involved in. And I think that meant a lot to him all his life, actually. Every she, time he was down, she picked him up. She sounds like a fascinating person, too. It's in 1906, Ray, that the young Wittgenstein leaves his family behind and heads to study mechanical engineering in Berlin. So what is it that leads him from that to philosophy? Okay, so he came to specialise in aeronautical engineering and went to Manchester. This is the very early days of, of flight and he was one of the pioneers of it. And he became interested in designing a jet engine and paid particular close attention to the design of the propellers, which was essentially a mathematical task. 
he got interested in mathematics and started attending lectures in pure mathematics and used to meet with some other mathematicians to discuss mathematics. And he got very interested in the question, what is mathematics? Which, of course, is a philosophical question. And he asked his friends in Manchester what had been written on that subject. And that brought him to Bertrand Russell's uh, Principles of Mathematics, which in turn led him to, to Frege's work. And his sister, Hermina, <laughs> describes him at this point being completely unable to think about anything but philosophy. And then it's as if he could bear it no longer. In 1911, without being in touch with Russell, without applying to Cambridge University <laughs> as an undergraduate or anything, he just got the train from Manchester to Cambridge and marched straight into Russell's room and discussed philosophy with him. Russell at that time wrote three letters a day to his lover, Ottoline. And so we have a, a, an incredibly <laughs> complete record of the early stages of Russell and Wittgenstein's acquaintanceship. And you can see that Russell wasn't sure whether he was mad or a genius. Mm. It only took a few months for him to decide that Wittgenstein was a genius. And then six months after that, he was telling Wittgenstein's sister that the next big step in philosophy will be taken by Ludwig Wittgenstein. Wow. Well, I, I want to wheel back a minute to talk about Frege and then come back to Russell, who these are two very important figures. Juliet, can I ask you about uh, to fill in the gaps about Frege? Because this is this is a German logician called Gottlieb Frege. Who is Frege and, and what's his role in Wittgenstein's thought, Juliet? Ah, well, Ray can tell us whom he met first. There were rumours that perhaps he'd gone to Frege first before he went to Russell. I'm not sure whether that's right. But uh, Frege was the first person to write down what we would today call a programming language. It's quite remarkable. There were formalised parts of logic before Frege, Boole and so on, algebra of logic with zeros and ones. But what Frege did was to finally provide a way in a formula language, a total freestanding language, just like a programming language you would see now, he figured out a way to codify all the deductive reasoning used in all of mathematics. It's quite remarkable. And he wrote a little book in 1879 called Begriffschrift. And I can see Wittgenstein being inspired by that. There's very little twaddle in German around the edges, to use Wittgenstein's later word. Uh, it's very powerful. And Wittgenstein, I think, should be credited with having seen that this would revolutionize not only logic, but philosophy itself. He saw that very early. And Russell, I think, pulled him along very well on that. It but he respected Frege and Frege's style literarily. At the end of his life, Wittgenstein uh, said to Peter Geech, if only I could have written like Frege. Really? Frege is beautifully clear, beautifully unadulterated as well. That, that sounds a lot like a, a way of describing the Tractatus too, that, that unembellished style. It's Frege who advises him in 1911 to go to Cambridge to study philosophy with Bertrand Russell Ray. Russell was, was making notes and upon, I think I read that upon meeting Wittgenstein, he made a note, an unknown German appeared obstinate and perverse, but I think not stupid. Uh, which is quite delightful. What what was it that he and Russell would be, be thinking about together in the coming years? Well, I think Russell was delighted to find somebody who shared his obsession with clearing up the logic that Russell believed was the foundation for mathematics. So both Frege and Russell shared philosophically the view that the answer to the question, what is mathematics, is logic. Mathematics is logic. And, and then both Frege and Russell tried to establish that formally. And both attempts to establish that were undercut by a contradiction that Russell discovered. And so Wittgenstein, I think, was drawn into this by this idea that there was something to clear up. Russell in the Principles of Mathematics says that he believes his view to be correct, even though there is this fundamental problem of the contradiction and that he advises young philosophers to address themselves to it. And I think that was the bait that hooked Wittgenstein. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't just Wittgenstein attending Russell's lectures. He, as it were, played Russell. He, you know, he would be 
in Russell's room while Russell was changing for dinner. And, you know, he was completely <laughs> and utterly obsessed. And Russell found that on the one hand quite delightful and sometimes was a bit irritated by it. You know, it was too intense even for Russell. I, I want to ask Monica about this because I, we're getting a sense from, from this relationship with Russell and Russell's remarkable note, obstinate, perverse, not stupid, that this is a, a really distinctive person. And I wonder if in the family too, there was a sense that this was a distinctive, perhaps quite eccentric person, but really quite brilliant. You mean that the, the, the siblings, that the siblings thought that it was brilliant? Yeah, yeah. I don't think so. No. No, no. They, they didn't realise... So the, some of the brothers were dead, smart brothers who had wanted to be musicians and were not allowed to. And the girls, except Gap, they were not so so smart, if I may say so. And also, they were not schooled in mathematics, nothing of the kind. It was sort of almost dangerous for them. Yeah. If you read the letters and so on, they don't understand. Yeah, he's a, they had a love for him as a brother, but not. Yeah, Paul Fred, in a bit, yes. Right, the one on the he he realized. Yes, they were they were they were very close, weren't they? Ray in Cambridge, Wittgenstein was uh, noted for his, I, I guess he, we would call it quite an austere personal aesthetic and his his friend and and probable lover David Pinsent wrote about trying to buy furniture with him for example why was that so difficult well because his standards were so exacting and he would reject anything that didn't meet them which meant that he would reject most things and he felt very strongly on the subject whether it was buying a bed or a or, or a desk or listening to a piece of music whatever it was he had standards, he applied this to people too, if a person or a thing or a piece of art failed to live up to those standards, he could be very severe, as he often was with Pinsent. What he shared with Pinsent was a love of music, particularly Schubert. Wittgenstein was a virtuoso whistler, really? and Pinsent played the piano, and they built up a rep repertoire of literally hundreds of Schubert songs Pinsent playing the piano while Wittgenstein whistled. And they went on holiday together and spent a lot of their free time playing Schubert songs. And that was a bonding thing between, between the two of them. You described them as lovers. I don't know whether they were lovers, but it's certainly true that Wittgenstein was in love with Pinsent. And I think because, because he shared this love of music, but also I think he saw in Pinsent a kind of unaffected... All, all the people that Wittgenstein liked have, to some extent, conformed to a type. They are clever, but they're not especially showy or witty. Um, and above all, they are truthful and simple and honest. I think those are the qualities he, yeah. he looked for. That's really interesting. Juliet, can we can we turn to the to the work in, in, in around about this time? In 1914, when the war broke out, what, what was the state of Wittgenstein's work? What was he, he doing? Ah, well, I think he had in mind the idea of writing a book uh, before then. Russell encouraged them to rewrite Principia Mathematica. I mean, it's really quite amazing. Uh, Russell's lectures, he'd get up and just start writing symbols on the board, you know, and then it was, well, go ahead, redo the whole thing. But by 1914, Wittgenstein had worked through arguments with Russell about the nature of truth that actually had a very devastating impact on Russell himself. Russell had developed these views of truth beginning in about 1906. He'd handled the paradoxes. Paradox was incredibly important for Wittgenstein. The whole idea that you could be going along in language and everything could be perfectly grammatical. And then all of a sudden, poof, the thing falls apart. This he thought was fantastically fascinating. Yeah. So by 1914, he's already got his basic views in place. And this involves a reworking both of Frege and of Russell, and I would say of the whole German tradition, Schopenhauer, Kant, uh, there's a kind of coding up, of a great coding of the history of philosophy to which Wittgenstein is responding, re-representing through the eyes of someone who has grappled with these problems in the foundations of logic and sees that philosophy somehow has to change. So uh, by 1914, among other things, he's got his picture idea of the proposition, which I know Don will have lots to say about. Um, but he's developed this in response to Russell. And 
redoing Russell's theory of truth. And, and Russell, in letters to Lady Ottoline, said that in 1913, Wittgenstein's criticisms of his views on truth just devastate him. He never felt that he could do fundamental work again after talking to Wittgenstein. And I wonder if we could ask you, Dawn, to give us a, a summary of the picture theory of language and, 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 and how it features in, in Wittgenstein's book. I think a nice way to think about it is Wittgenstein's own influence in how he came up with the picture theory of language, where he talks about reading about a courtroom case where there was a traffic incident and in the court they used a model of cars to present uh, the state of affairs that had happened. And Wittgenstein's picture theory of language is a way of saying that all of our normal language, even our speech, our writing, in a sense, models the world, presents us with a model of how the world might be. And although it might not immediately seem like the written words on a page or the, the words that you can hear spoken are a picture, Wittgenstein's point is that the, there is a structure to every proposition. There's an arrangement of elements and that arrangement or configuration of elements uh, stands for elements in reality in the world that the, the car, the red car might be to the left of the blue car or the blue car might be to the left of the, the red car. They're both possible ways the world might be and a proposition can depict the way the world can be independent of how the world actually is. That's the important point of a picture theory of propositions. It doesn't just give a picture of how the world actually is, it gives us pictures of how the world might possibly be. Um, and the idea is that all of our language, the natural language and also um, formal languages in logic all works the same way. I, I want to get to the, the, the propositions in a moment, but just for a moment, can we, we, we pause with the, with the war, Ray, because Wittgenstein had a, had a very ac active war. Can you tell us about his, his wartime service? Yeah, so, well, let's start with why he enlisted. I think one motivation was he'd, he'd read William James's Varieties of Religious Experience and had been very impressed with it. And one of the themes of that book is that facing death can have a transforming effect on a person because when they face death, they're face to face with the most important thing that they've ever experienced. And I think Wittgenstein wanted the experience of facing death. And that was a motivation in enlisting. He enlisted as a private coming from the family that he did. He could like his brother Paul had done, you know, join a fancy reg regiment, a cavalry regiment or something, but he didn't. He enlisted as, as, as a private in the artillery. And he didn't actually get to face death until halfway through the war, until 1916. The authorities wanted to preserve him, so they kept him behind the lines, and he kept applying to move up to the front. Eventually, he got to the front in 1916. He was uh, fighting on the Russian front, which was brutal, all the time filling little notebooks with philosophical reflections. Now, as well as the philosophical reflections, he wrote personal remarks into these notebooks. And he used a code for those, a very simple code that he'd, he'd used with his family. But then in, suddenly in 1916, the tone of his work changes his philosophy. Previously, it's all been about logic and language. And suddenly he asks, what do I know about God? Hmm. And this not, now is not, you, you might expect this to be in code because it sounds, sounds very different to his philosophical work. But he's now presenting this as part of his philosophical reflections and the distinction that he had made in trying to understand logic between saying and showing, he now applies to ethics, aesthetics, religion. And so when the book is finally finished at the end of the First World War, it's, you know, five sixths on logic and language and one sixth on what he called the mystical. Mm. So the idea that there are things that we cannot say, but that we can show which things he calls the mystical now form a very impo important part of the book. It, Juliet, you're, you're nodding along to this. Is that because you similarly think that, that the war had a profound effect on his, his philosophical work and the directions it was taking? Yes, the American saying is there are no atheists in foxholes. <laughs> uh, clearly, the experiences manning the searchlight on the boat, which was the most dangerous place to be 
Uh, I think Wittgenstein also had a kind of sense of wanting to be independent of his family. Perhaps, Monaco, you'll disagree. I think he wanted to go out and, in a sense, have his independence. He both wanted that experience of death, but he also wanted to be somehow independent of his family and take a stand and become someone. This is very interesting about him. You know, he saw a lot of violence in his life. He was an incredibly anxious person. And a lot of the stories of his interactions with people, the severity that an exactitude that Ray has spoken of, this is a person with PTSD in our yeah. terms. So I, I do think the war had a tremendous, tremendous impact on him. M Monica's nodding along to, to your observation that he, he wanted independence. So he, he had a, a gospel with him, a Tolstoy, Tolstoy's uh, short expose, which also meant a lot to him. And he read a lot of Dostoevsky and so on. But I also think that th this language, you know, not being able to have words for the horrible things, he, that was something that was in the time also, like Tachel, the poet, and others, had, and Hoffman's Tal already had written about this. It was also not only Wittgenstein who was dealing with this terrible difficulties to, of expression of these times. And to what you said, Juliet, of course he wanted to get freed of his father, specifically, who was a very tough father and you and very protestantic and you know duty meant everything to him and also he did got, he got rid of his money because of that he didn't want to be rich he wanted to be independent i mean he went very very far to become free but still emotionally he didn't get free mm -hmm. you know Yes. You can try as hard as you want, but there's still something else. Yes. Ray, can I, 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 can I encourage you to, to turn us toward, towards the Tractatus now? What do we know about the actual writing of the Tractatus? What were the conditions in which it was produced? It was finished during a break from his army service when he was staying with his uncle. And he took it back with him to fight on the Italian front. The Russian front had then closed and he fought on the Italian front. And he was made a prisoner of war. And the Italians kept their prisoners of war long after the war had finished. So Wittgenstein didn't get back to Vienna until 1919. He spent a year in a prisoner of war camp. But he was able to correspond with Russell and tell him that he'd finished the book. So the book, the book by then was, was finished. Almost everything Wittgenstein wrote, one might see as a compilation, because he would write remarks in these notebooks, and he built up a, a huge number of notebooks. From those notebooks, then, he would compile the Tractatus, and it's written in an almost impossibly distilled way. When it was translated into English, the translator, Ogden, had heard that Wittgenstein had other remarks and, and suggested to Wittgenstein that they might include some of those because after all, it's a rather small book and it's very, um, it's very dense. Uh, so why not include some of these other remarks? It might clear some things up. Wittgenstein's reply was, uh, he said, well, look, when you order a, a table from a carpenter, you don't also want the shavings that he's removed <laughs> from the wood to produce the table. He had a very exact aesthetic standard that we've mentioned before, but he applied that also to his work. The mm -hmm. Tractatus can be seen as a, as, a, as a work of poetry, I think. It's so distilled and compressed, and so much attention has been given to the exact wording of each proposition in it. It is very interesting to hear, hear you describe it as a, as a book of poetry. And I, I want to come to, to Dawn for, for a moment now, too, because I, the book is a series of numbered propositions. So it, it does feel odd to think of it as poetry. But for those who aren't familiar with it, tell me what it looks like when you see it and, and, and give me a sense of why it's arranged in this way. Well, certainly, as we've described with our first experience of it, when you, when you open the page and look, I think the... The sheer number of numbers is quite daunting. So when you open the first page and and you see uh, remark number one, 
But underneath remark one, number one, you have the numberings 1.1, 1.11, 1. 1. 1.12, <laughs> and so it goes on through the book. And, and an initial sort of feeling that you're trying to make sense of, of, of an argument that these, these numbers must be somehow connected to one another. Perhaps you might think it's something like premises leading to a conclusion or, or, or you know, an, an axiomatic method or something. So you sort of feel like there must be a method here to make sense of it. But I think in many ways, the, the structuring of the numbers is best made sense of thinking of it as, as a route to guide you through the thoughts. It, it's, it's more of a way that Wittgenstein wants to lead you through thoughts that he has in a, in a, in a sequence that leads you somewhere, that, that in a way can assist your understanding. So I, I think one of the best ways to think about it, and most people start it this way, is to look at the, the, the seven main propositions of the book. And the numbering system famously, if you just try and read it down the page, one remark after the next remark after the next one, you soon get lost, you get in a muddle. It's very tempting to do that, but it, it gets you lost. If instead you start to follow the numbers along, so you read 1.1 and then perhaps read 1.2 after 1.1, skipping a few propositions and then coming back again. So following the threads, uh, use, letting the number system guide you, then you can start to, to feel like Wittgenstein is, is guiding you through his ideas. And, and that helps, I think. We, I think some of us might need all the help we can get, but it, this is he very helpful indeed. I, we're talking about propositions as though we know what they are. What is a proposition? Can you, can you give me an example of one, for instance, and, and how we're meant to understand it, Dawn? Well, in the first instance, propositions are the propositions of our natural language, our ordinary language, the English language, the German language. So propositions are in front of us, around us, we're using them as we're communicating with one another now. And in one sense, Wittgenstein wants us to know that uh, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about ordinary uh, statements, utterances, things that we say to one another. However, there is also a technical sense of proposition that's at work um, and, and is elucidated in the Tractatus. And in that sense, Wittgenstein is doing something slightly different to, to Frege and Russell. So Frege and Russell, through the very powerful logical and technical apparatus they've given us, have showed us that it's possible to do philosophy using uh, a more idealised language, using logical notation and this sort of extreme clarity to produce expressions for the purposes of doing philosophy mm. that, that have very clear logical structure to them. Wittgenstein also believed that it, our, our ordinary propositions have an underlying logical structure to them. He thinks that all the propositions of our natural language that we, we encounter, uh, we can't immediately see the logical structure of them because the appearance of, of our natural language disguises the underlying logical structure. But he thinks that nonetheless, it's important to recognise that every proposition of natural language has a, a, a formal content that is perfect, it's logically perfect. So although the propositions of our language may seem messy when we're using them, if we perform a logical analysis on them and get underneath, we find that every single proposition has a perfect logical structure. We've been talking about the, the form of the book and I, I'm getting the sense that the form is as important as the content, but I really want to know about the content, content, content too. What are we being propositioned with? And, and I know that the Tractatus deals with an extraordinary range of topics. Um, from the relationship between the world, thought and language to the nature of logic and scientific explanation. And Wittgenstein is also thinking about the nature of the self and mysticism, the, the meaning of life in short, all in under 100 pages. I wonder for each of you, is there a key question or an idea that we should take away from this book? Ray? Well, Wittgenstein himself told Russell that the most important idea in the book was the distinction between saying and showing. The, the, the most important idea is that there are things which cannot be said. He also believes that all philosophical questions arose because of a lack of understanding of the logic of our language. And he thought that one reason we failed to understand the logic of our language was that we repeatedly fell into the temptation of trying to say what cannot be said. So when he was trying to get the book published, he wrote to a prospective publisher and said, this book consists of two parts, the part that I've written and the part that I haven't written. And he said, precisely the second part is the more important. <laughs> it's, it's, it's what he's stayed silent about. Juliet? 
Yes, I very much agree with what Ray has said. I mean, I think to make this timely for our time, the book is about the spirit of truth, of what's involved in a commitment to truth. And we're all entangled with truth. I mean, even if you're a liar like Donald Trump, you're entangled with this. So there's a sense in which logic becomes for Wittgenstein an unfolding of the notion of truth, the idea of being committed to truth, and there's an ethical side to that. Learning that fake propositions that appear to say things, but that really don't, right? Uh, and a, a critic who attempts to tell you what's in Schubert, as opposed to whistling it or playing it with David Pinsent. Right. These are falsities that need to be combated. And the way he has of doing that is very poetic. Logic and poetry, in some sense, are, are very close because they're about our getting ourselves to reflect on forms in language and necessities of language. So I think the spirit of truth, the idea of reality, the idea there are no alternative facts, you know, that lit up on Twitter when Kellyanne Conway said that, <laughs> it's very deep in our thinking. And I think we see now more and more that to have a democracy, you've got to have people who at least think through what's involved in the notion of a fact. For me, that's what makes the book still so timely. That's and the, when I teach it, I try to connect these issues up with one another. That, that makes it sound very exacting and, 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 and rigorous. And, and, and Dawn? Um, I take Wittgenstein very seriously when he says that the whole sense of the book can be summed up in the following words. He says, what can be said at all can be said clearly, and what we cannot talk about we must pass over in silence. Now, later in the book, we find him, him saying a reiteration of this, that everything that can be thought at all can be thought clearly. Everything that can be put into words can be put clearly. So part of the question is this, emphasis on clarity, the achievement of clarity, where this gets us, why we, we need it. And I agree completely with Juliet about the importance of truth, but part of Wittgenstein's point is for us to be able to understand which claims are true or which are false, we must get clear about what our propositions are saying in the first place. Um, in fact, the only way we can ever tell whether a proposition is true or false is if we can see clearly what the sense of the proposition is. So you find, I think the most important aspect of the Tractatus is this emphasis on saying what we can say clearly. And when we're tempted to go beyond what we can say clearly, to say nothing rather than say something that's going to cause confusion, nonsense, and perhaps lead other people to have problems that need to be then cleared up. Let me say something instead of nothing for a moment. You're listening to Free Thinking with me, Shahid Abari, on BBC Radio 3. And you can find us as the Arts and Ideas podcast on BBC Sounds 2. If you'd like to learn more about philosophy, then do immerse yourself in our dedicated philosophy playlist, which includes programmes from our archive on John Rawls, Michel Foucault, and even an episode devoted to what Ludwig did next, Wittgenstein's private language argument. Just head to bbc.co.uk forward slash free thinking. Dawn, let me come back to you. J j just last week, we made a programme about epistemic injustice, which dovetails the philosophical terrains of ethics and epistemology, but it's ethics and logic that are joined in the Tractatus. Is this a, a radical move? And why is it that they're so closely related for Wittgenstein? I think it's actually to do with the, uh, the idea that he thinks that clarity of thought and clarity of expression is absolutely vital. One of the most important parts of the book is it's not merely providing us with an, a, a, an account of language, an account of logic, an account of thought, an account of the world in the way that many philosophy books in the history of philosophy have tried to do so. It's also presenting us with an overturning of how philosophy has been done up until this point. Um, he calls it elsewhere, one of the heirs to the subject formerly known as philosophy. And, and part of that is he thinks it carries philosophy um, has been done in the wrong way until now. It, it has been done in a way that's misunderstood what the purpose and the task of philosophy has been. And part of that is, to, is leads to his idea that there's an ethical um, significance to the work of doing philosophy. 
um, he sees it as a kind of work that somebody has to carry out on themselves, on their own thinking, on the clarity of their thought, you know, on the precision of their expression and how they communicate with others. And I think one of the ways that you can see the significance of the book, as, as Ray has mentioned, the unwritten second half of the book, um, is the idea that if you've understood the book, if you've understood the conception of logic and the relationship between thought, language and the world that's presented in the book, then you are left with uh, almost you might think of as a, a moral imperative about how you should continue from that point onwards. And that's left up to you at that point. When, when you get to the, the last rung of the ladder of the book and you leave it behind, that you're left in an ethical space. This is what he's told the editor. It's it's the ethical um, role. So you go through the logic and you arrive in the space of the ethical and that's up to you. He doesn't tell you at that point uh, what you do. That is your responsibility, I think. Throughout his life, not just when he wrote the Tractatus, Wittgenstein was driven, and driven is the right word, by two imperatives. One, to think clearly and the other to be a decent person. And he saw those two as two parts of the same duty. Logic, thinking clearly, ethics, being decent. And there is a remark in a book that he wrote, that he read very early on in his life, um, Sex and Character, by Otto Weininger. Weininger says, logic and ethics are fundamentally the same. They are both aspects of the single duty to oneself. Wittgenstein's friend Ludwig Hensel once asked him, what can I do to improve the world? And Wittgenstein replied, improve yourself. That is the only thing you can do to improve the world. Wittgenstein has a very profound idea, which is that if you take solipsism seriously, the idea that you're the most important self or perhaps the only self in the world, and you think that through, really yourself vanishes and you end up with realism. You end up with acknowledging reality as a whole. And so this recasting of the self's expressions in language is part and parcel of the poetic work he's doing in the book. The Tractatus, as Ray says, has influenced artists, poets, also philosophers of logic and language. But I would say in, in non-Western philosophy, I have a growing number of students who are interested in Buddhist traditions, where emptying the self, recasting your picture of the self as an object is really fundamental to thinking through a place in the world from which you can be a decent person. And I'm reminded of a remark he made uh, that there is no machine for becoming decent. There's no machine. That's a very profound idea about ethics and um, connected with this idea of the self. C can we talk, this is going to be impossible, but can we talk about the ineffable now for a moment, or at least try to? Uh, Juliet, I, I want to ask you about this. This is Wittgenstein's idea that there is a distinction between what can be said and what can't be said, but is shown. And the book ends with this, this final proposition that has become rather famous in philosophy circles what we cannot speak of, we must pass over in silence. What does he mean by the ineffable? Well, in logic, there are paradoxes. And one of the primary paradoxes that you face, that Russell helped us face, is what is it to talk about all propositions? But if we try to talk about all propositions, then the one I just uttered is one of them. So here we get entangled in the very statement about all propositions has something that goes wrong with it, actually. It goes wrong technically, actually, in Russell's logic, as Russell shows. And so Wittgenstein has to find a different way of thinking about how we face the limits of expression. So I quite agree with Monica. It's a problem of expression that's common at the time in the First World War. There has been a certain kind of decay in cultural expression, and Wittgenstein is trying to cut away the, the dross and get to the essential skeleton. But his essential idea is that logic is not in the business of telling you what is in fact true and what is in fact false. Logic is an activity of thinking about your own ways of calling things true and calling things false. 
And I'm implicated in that ethically. So uh, nonsense occurs when you attempt to distance yourself from this self-entanglement and try to talk about, you know, a domain of ethical facts, for example. Uh, that's a fake. That is not going to hold up in Wittgenstein's view. Or you might try to talk about all propositions and tell people about that as if you are uttering words that are informative. But essentially, the limits of thought, the limits of logic, are seen in the doing of logic itself. They show themselves, Wittgenstein will say. But it's not that you can lay down a principle and say, OK, violate this, and it's nonsense, mm -hmm. or violate this, and you're a bad person. No. Ethics has to do with our responses to particular ways people have of calling things like they see them. Mm -hmm. And this is a very difficult point of view, but nonsense is both something that occurs in the foundations of logic and something that occurs in, in real life as we try to call things impossible or unthinkable in ethical context. So it has to do with the unthinkable. And unlike Kant, unlike earlier philosophers, he's not going to give you a theory of categories or a moral imperative principle or some psychological principle. He's going to say, no, you must face your own statements and see whether they make sense. And that's very much up to you. So that's how nonsense, and he applies it, of course, to himself in the final uh, remarks of the book. He says, anyone who understands me understands that the remarks of the Tractatus are themselves nonsensical. And why? Because they could be regarded as dogmatic pronouncements about how reality has to be. But this is not what he's trying to do. He wants you only to be involved in that activity of thinking through what is reality? What is it to call something like I see it and get it right or get it wrong? What is it for me to disagree or call someone's remark unthinkable? So that's self-reflection. And nonsense happens when people substitute for that work of taking our own words in life seriously, a principle or a domain or a, some kind of abstract structure that's going to take care of us. What I'm understanding here is, is an, an aversion to, to issuing dogma or something dogmatic, a set of instructions. And I wonder if, if I could come back to the term you used on, which was an ethical imperative. Is, is, the aim, is there something in the book that is invocatory? Is it asking the reader to work on themselves in some way? And, and, and how? Hmm, I think, yes, I would agree with something like that. So Wittgenstein says in the very opening paragraph, this book is not a textbook. Um, right. And its purpose would achieve, be achieved if it gave pleasure to a reader who read and understood it. Now, part of what's meant by that is the idea that in a strict sense, what the book in, it invites somebody to reflect upon and to go through a process of self-reflection as they're working their way through it, as well as sharing in Wittgenstein's thought, um, is the idea that you could do without the book. The book itself is completely, strictly speaking, unnecessary. And although Wittgenstein was very keen to have it published and worked on it with great intensity in that period of his life, one of the paradoxes here in, in, in Juliet's sense is that he knows that in one sense, everything that he is elucidating in the book is there for anybody to grasp for themselves simply by being thinkers and language users who cannot but be bound by um, the logic of the language uh, that they're using. And the logic of the language that we use on our natural language is there for us to see um, if we pay attention to it, if we pay attention to how we express ourselves and how other people are expressing their ideas, it's there to be seen. So the book itself isn't strictly necessary. And yet um, there is a sort of profound experience, I think, that a lot of people have when they wrestle with the book and they feel like they, it's changed their uh, understanding um, when they, they get to the end of it. But strictly speaking, he is trying to say to us, you don't need this book. It's not giving you doctrine. It's not giving you a set of rules for how to live your life or even strictly speaking, how to do philosophy. Although, of course, it's had a great influence in, in thinking about how to do philosophy. But strictly speaking, yes, you don't need it. 
Is that is that what he means by by with the 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 metaphor, the analogy of the, of the ladder, the instruction that readers must pull up the ladder after they've read the book? What what what, what does that? How do we understand that? Well, when we get to the end of the book, uh, the penultimate remark of the book. So uh, we we have the very final remark says uh, what we cannot speak about we must pass over in silence and we're left there but just before that as a sort of final word before <laughs> before he ends the book Wittgenstein uh, says my propositions serve as elucidations in the following way anyone who understands me eventually recognizes them as nonsensical when he's used them steps to climb up beyond them he must so to speak throw away the ladder after he's climbed up it he must transcend these propositions and then he will see the world aright. Now, that proposition um, has, has been interpreted in very many different ways. It's, it's a, another kind of lure to, to many readers and interpreters mm. and philosophers to try to make sense of the book as a whole. I am very inclined to, um, to think that what Wittgenstein is saying here is that although you've travelled up the propositions of the tractatus to arrive to this point you don't need to cling on to those propositions as a set of truths he's, he's clear at one point of the book that um, the work of philosophy does not consist of philosophical propositions for example so you, you don't need to be hanging on to it and and in a sense you shouldn't need to refer to the tractatus chapter and verse to be able to defend particular positions uh, once you've read the book um, I think it's just a way of clearing the way for what comes next, which is pro proposition number seven, which is what we cannot speak about, we must pass over in science, which of course refers us back to the preface of the book where he says this is um, how you can sum up the sense of the book. So there is a kind of sense that there's a clearing away of what's gone before. Yes, uh, just to follow up, Dawn, on something you said at the end about the end of the book, I really prefer the translation of the person who understands me will overcome these propositions, not that they will transcend them. Because if we regard it as transcendence, we might think of ourselves as climbing up into a mystical other world. Mm. But überwinden in German means to overcome. Mm. So through appreciating the activity of logical reflection, overcome the tractatus, the need for the tractatus, which is what you were saying before. Yes, that's about right. About overcoming the need for the book. So yes, that's right. Overcoming rather than transcendence. Yes. And I think where we're left with is rather than thinking that at the end of the book, uh, the realm of silence or the realm of what it would be nonsensical to speak to speak about is, is a realm that shows itself beyond language. It's rather what we're left with is what shows itself or manifests itself or displays itself just is language. It's the logical form of language. That's what shows itself ultimately. So when Wittgenstein is saying that the, the aim of the book is to draw a limit to the expression of thoughts from within language, um, what shows itself is within the limits um, of language and the world. It, it's not something that lies beyond the limits of language in, in a different realm. So paying attention to logical form of language is what we're left with when we're trying to grasp what shows itself. Let's go back to the preface just for, for a moment. Uh, um, Ray, perhaps I can come to you. And, and that original claim, Wittgenstein's claim to have solved all the problems of philosophy. By the end of the book, has he? What does that solution look like? I don't know of anybody who believes that the Tractatus solves all the problems of philosophy. What that claim rests upon is the idea that every problem in philosophy is ultimately to be answered by clearing up misunderstandings about the logic of our language. And again, I mean, if there are other people who believe that, it's very much a minority view. So I don't know of many discussions that set that incredibly high bar, you know, that the book is successful if it solves all the problems of philosophy. You know, there, there, there has been, you know, thousands of discussions of this book, and they tend to focus on the theory of meaning and logic. And so the question that, that gets asked and answered in different ways is, what is Wittgenstein's view of the nature of logic and uh, of meaning? And is he right? So the influence the book has had is far more restricted than I think than he wanted. But f at least for a while, it was enormously influential. And many of the leading philosophers of the 20th century 
thought that Wittgenstein had asked the right questions and given correct answers to them about logic and, and language. He changed his mind himself. Well, perhaps I, I can I can ask about this. We know that, that later in his life, um, he, he even though he ends the book with this confident note of finality that all has been solved, the philosophy he produced later is, is significantly different. So, so what did Wittgenstein think of the Tractatus later in life? Um, perhaps I can ask you that, Dawn. Well, it's interesting that in the pref- preface, he says that he's conscious of falling a long way short of what's possible in the Tractatus itself. He he thinks he's solved the problems of philosophy, but he doesn't necessarily think he's done a perfect job of it. And he says, maybe my powers are too slight. May others come and do better. There is a sort of an invitation there in the preface that the project of the Tractatus could, in principle, be done better, ex- expressed in a better way. Others could come and do it. And there's a sense that I think for a period of his life, he imagined that it would be possible to return to the project of the Tractatus and tidy up some of the problems that had. Uh, cropped up later that that other philosophers had drawn his attention to. And he thought that some of those problems could be fixed and the project could be perfected. I think when he underwent a really radical phase of his later career was realising that there was something much more profoundly um, wrong about the the project of the Tractatus. And he once said to Elizabeth Anscombe um, that the Tractatus is not a bag of junk pretending to be a clock. It's a clock that a working clock that tells the wrong time. And I think he looked back on the Tractatus with, with a sense of an achievement because it, it, it is a sublimely um, well-crafted um, piece of work. However, in his later work, he, he realized for one thing that the temptation in the Tractatus to think that the propositions of language um, have a, a a lo- share a logical form, a logical space that's a sort of uniform, absolute, rigid, complete, singular system that whenever you analyse the propositions of natural language, ultimately you can reduce them down to elementary propositions that are all part of a single logical space. He, he started to realise, among other things, that language doesn't all work that way. And although the Tractatus, you might say, is a a very good picture of some very specific types of language construction. It's not an adequate picture of the whole of natural language and particularly language as it's used by um, communities of language users in for many different purposes. So the investigations becomes a uh, a work that that reflects and investigates that. Ray, even if Wittgenstein changes his mind about the Tractatus, a hundred years since that book was published. What have philosophers made of this book? Where has it has it made a significant impact within philosophy? Um, I think in the areas of, of logic and language and to a lesser extent, the philosophy of mathematics. And then there's a whole very different strand of influence, um, you know, which is worth talking about, I think, which is not confined to philosophy and certainly not to academic philosophy. It's had a great influence among artists, for example, and writers um, and creative people of all, ty- all types. It's, it's been set to music. Um, musicians, poets, um, painters all see in that, that those last few remarks of Wittgenstein thoughts that chime very much with, with their own. They, they, you know, uh, I mean, I've, I've met a lot of artists who talk about the influence that Wittgenstein has had on them, and they do not mean the theory of logic and the theory of meaning, they mean the statements about uh, about the mystical at, at the end of at the end of the book, uh, and and also the idea of what's involved in representing and what's involved in in saying something and using uh, trying to convey something by showing it. Um, I think that is that that has influenced a surprising number of people and a surprisingly wide range of people. Within philosophy, however, it has tended to, the influence of Wittgenstein has tended to be focused on the, what's called the picture theory of meaning that Dawn mentioned, and uh, Wittgenstein's views in the Tractatus on the nature of logic. 
And Julie, I think you you call it a musical book. In, in what way? I, I see it. it's the poetic qualities of it, which in some sense are shared and reworked in his later philosophy as well. And he wanted the investigations published beside the Tractatus to let readers think about what the nature of progress had really been in his life. And up through uncertainty, the last notes he wrote about four days before he died, there are many remarks where you can see that he's going back to the Tractatus and asking himself, how much was in the way I put it there? And how much are the variations changed at this point? So the idea of a variation is very common in music, symphonic music, let's say. But in, in Wittgenstein, it's very clear there are echo effects that go on throughout the Tractatus. And so if you pick it up and begin reading it, as Dawn said, one proposition at a time, the real thing is to stop and reflect almost at the pictorial quality of the roots of German that are reworked and echoed I'm no expert on German, Monica, but I've been told that it represents the most beautiful Viennese German of the time. And, and you know, the first, German, the first remark, and, and ist alles, German, was der Fallest, it rhymes. Viennese German is very beautiful, and it's a very special language. And I also want to add that he writes that philosophy really should be written as poetry. Hmm. He writes that himself. So, I mean, exactly as you all say, and, and, and you, of course, uh, he has uh, been a great uh, influence to artists of all kinds. Monica, I want to give the last word to you, um, listening in to this philosophical discussion. How do you feel about your great ancestor? I want to say I met him. And meeting him as a 15-year-old, knowing that he was uh, now, I realized that he was sort of almost <clears throat> autistic and very severe, but very nice to me when he invited me to Cambridge. But every question he asked and every answer I gave, he went on asking, why did I answer this? <laughs> Why did I do this? So all the time there was a repetitive discussion between us, and I thought he was quite odd, nice, an uncle, whatever. But then we went to see Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, and that he loved. You know he loved musicals. And then it became much easier and, and everything was fine. But the beginning was like a, a philosophical discussion with a 15-year-old who couldn't understand a, mm. what, what, where he was getting. Thank you so much to Monica nagler wittgenstein Dawn Wilson, Juliet Floyd, Ray Monk and our partners at the Austrian Cultural Forum in London and the British Wittgenstein Society. Thanks also to producer Luke Mulhall. As ever, to puzzle over more big ideas, do head over to our archive and the philosophy playlist at bbc.co.uk forward slash free thinking. Goodbye.